Warren, you and I have been talking about the quality of leadership in this country and the world for a good number of years, but it's never seemed uh, more than today the need for leadership, effective leadership, than what we face today. Do you agree with that? Uh, David, I, I do. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if I can point to one of the things that the center's doing, which uh, began about five years ago, I think, which is the National Survey on Confidence in Our Leadership. And I use that diagram all the time, showing in every single institution, with a possible exception of military, it's really had a deep downward slope from 05, and the last one was 08. And, you know, there, almost in every case, uh, there's been a, a, a deeper decline than one would expect because I always think there's a, a, a times in our society regularly where we think, well, you know, we don't have enough leadership. So, so I think it's especially acute right now. But, and I think it's acute for all sorts of reasons. But just to put a little bit in context, uh, just think, when you, when you began the center in 2000, <laughs> uh, it was a dot-com bomb bust. Uh, before that, there were the scandals of corporate America, Enron being the emblematic example, MCI and many others. Uh, and then we had 9-11, three, uh, I think, uh, axial turning points, seismic tectonics really shaking. And then finally, now that this incredible global financial uh, crisis we're in, those four pivotal events, I think, you know, it's in your face. And we, and in, in the center, uh, to anywhere, you're dealing with these kinds of issues right now. It's the most challenging, most exciting period of time. I mean, I, I really think in some way, without sounding uh, sappy about this, that this is, I'm encouraged uh, by the challenges we're facing. Because I think it's going to create a generation, what I'm calling the crucible generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's, it's a time when great leaders are formed. And it's a time when there are opportunities that the center has, that we have, that the country has. Because that's when leaders are forged and formed. Yeah, one is inevitably reminded of uh, Abigail Adams writing to her son, yeah. uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, when he was a young boy, and saying that, that times of adversity are, are the ones that call forth great statesmen, uh, people who, 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 are, who are forged in, in, in hard times and face hard challenges. Uh, that's when people step forward, and, and, and you do. But I, my, my own sense, Warren, in a, in a broader way, as I've looked over the last 10 years, uh, is that there's a parallel between uh, the opening of this new century and the opening of the 20th century. You know, the, uh, the 20th century began um, uh, with a sense of triumphalism. Uh, there had been peace in Europe uh, since the times of Napoleon. Uh, there were great inventions coming online. Mm -hmm. uh, trade was increasing among nations. Uh, and as, as, we, as we went from the 1800s to the 1900s, uh, there was a widespread, there were widespread commentaries that the 1900s were going to be a new golden age uh, in, in human history. And then what happened? Uh, the next 50 years were the bloodiest in all of human history. Uh, and we went over a cliff economically. And, uh, you know, it was uh, when, when John Maynard Keynes was asked uh, uh, in the early years of the Depression, have we ever seen anything like this before? He said, yes, that was called the Dark Ages. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and people, you know, as you know, have asked, well, why, what happened? Why did we go off the rails in the first 50 years of the, of the uh, 20th century? And uh, there are many explanations, but one from uh, uh, John Keegan, uh, the British military historian, who said, if you want to understand the history of the 20th century, uh, you can find it, and especially the political history, you can find it in the biographies of six men uh, and uh, they, who really wrote the history of that century, or early part of it. And he said they were Lenin, uh, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Churchill, and Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that list, you know, four of them were tyrannical leaders. Um, and they really helped to take us over a cliff. They, they led all that bloodshed. And had it not been for the last two, uh, Western civilization might have perished as we have known it. So it was that there was a quality of bad leadership that got us into a lot of trouble. And I worry a lot that the, tw the 21st century opened again with a sense of triumphalism. We, we were, you know, the Cold War was over. 
the United mm -hmm. States had emerged as a great superpower. It was since, you know, history was over, as Francis Fukuyama wrote. The, the, war, the ideas of liberty and uh, free peoples and free markets had triumphed. Uh, and that we were, we, we were managers of our own prosperity, trade was growing, globalization was going to be a great thing. And here we are, you know, almost 10 years into the century, and a lot of terrible things have happened. And so I think the question becomes for us now, can we provide the quality of good leadership that takes us in a much more positive direction, or are we going to suffer from a, a lack of good leadership, or are we going to have some really terrible leadership that could repeat some of the mistakes of the early uh, uh, 20th century. So to me, that's the, the mm -hmm. challenge, the fundamental challenge, mm -hmm. uh, and why leadership becomes so important um, in this in this uh, period. That that we're you know we're always say we're at a crossroads, but I I do think we're at a crossroads now about whether civilization moves forward in a positive way, or whether through a lack of leadership or through bad leadership, we find ourselves slipping down a path. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say on global warming. If, mm -hmm. if we don't really come to grips with global warming and we have a failure of leadership on that, uh, it could cook the planet and you could have a catastrophe. So there's much here that uh, is at stake on, on the question mm -hmm. of leadership. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I, I can just sort of chime in just a bit of that, David. Um, I would have... I would have dated the triumphalism as really post World War II. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because I was in that war. Well, you were. You were the you were the Battle of the Bulge, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know you had the feeling that uh, even though there were a lot of jokes being made about organization men, that in fact it was the first time so many of us could buy a home. It was right. the first. It was. I remember John Wooden, who probably in the East Coast is not as well known here in the West Coast as a marvelous basketball coach and you know and all, I'm, I'm teasing a bit on that well we, you know we have I our coach you Cage, you have but, your john woodens but he's you know the, the 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 dislocations that occurred during world war ii people were on a train little for the first time many on an airplane for the first time and john wooden told me that he probably would have ended his life had it not been for world war ii teaching elementary english to kids in an indiana school so that's just one little example of that kind of shift. But in, in a way, the problems you outlined a little while ago strike me as perhaps more difficult, more profound than uh, uh, than, I, than some of the others. And I remember you're saying it was Super Tuesday last year right. in 08, I think it was February 8th, and you stopped by my class at USC and talked with us for about an hour or so. And you said the problems, this is now, remember, February 8, 2008, 2008. And you said, you know, the problem that this new president, whoever it is, uh, is probably going to be dealing with the most serious problems since at least FDR. I thought a lot about that. Other people have commented on it, but I think they're far worse. Mm -hmm. In fact, David, if I may, I have a, a, a phrase that I've... Um, my undergraduate class doesn't get it, but I know others, grown-ups do. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's, got, it, it's, a, it's an analogy to the heart. And some people have heart conditions which are called arrhythmias, chaotic mm -hmm. beats. And, and uh, uh, personally, myself, experiencing some of that, I think about global arrhythmia. I think this mm -hmm. is a period I see with so much chaos so much, so many unknowns, so many, uh, just certainly on the economic front alone. So I do think you're right. I think this is probably the most challenging period, but that's what gives me a great deal of, of hope because in, in the first place, um, I, I, think, I think we're going to have to start really freshly imagining a future. There, in a recent issue of The Economist, there was a marvelous and fairly just a four pager on the current state of macroeconomics. Right. You know, and, and you probably took a look at it. I thought it was just beautifully written. And and it's very clear that nobody right now, not Krugman, not Summers, really not anyone really, uh, whether you're a Keynesian or Friedmanite, doesn't matter. Uh, there's, there's really, and I think we have to really, just as Roosevelt stumbled into some of the ideas which, which we, as we 
look back to the shining ether of history, it looks like Roosevelt, you know, was you know made all these great moves. Roosevelt stumbled and experimented and moved into. I think we're going through a period right now where we have to have the courage, underlying courage, to really take some risks and experiment. Because I don't think anybody has the solution right now to the so-called third way or way of how we bring together uh, what the argument is about today, fiscal stimulus versus a monetaristic policy. Mm -hmm. So th this is what excites me, the, the global arrhythmia. And the fact is that I do think there are different requirements, David, for the kind of new leaders. Mm -hmm. And and I think the Senate is getting at them. And I'd like to just take a crack at, a, at this one example. And then I'd love to hear your response to it. Uh, I, I, when I'm with you, I must confess that I always want you to do more of the talking, but uh, you always just, seem to just win, the other always, way around. You always seem to win out on me by your, your yeah. anyway. So I was thinking about the situation, the situation which happened in Najaf, Iraq, back in um, a latter part of '03 or the beginning of '04, and it was an awful riot occurring in Najaf, which and it, 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 the mosque is one of the holiest. And there were just hundreds of angry, shrieking, roiling Iraqis coming down the steps of the mosque and surrounding a group of American soldiers. Uh, it was a remarkable scene. I read about it. I finally got the CNN uh, actual filming of this scene, David. And it's quite remarkable because you, you, you really thought a shot's going to be fired, the Americans are going to start firing back, and we're going to see. Iraq, Mi Lai, Iraq version. So out of the blue, somebody stands up, the officer in charge, holds his rifle up to the air, puts the muzzle down toward the ground, and tells his men, about 45 of them, take a knee, which really means kneel. These are the American put, soldiers. Yeah, and, and put your back to the uh, Iraqis and, and kneel, and look like you're not frightened and terrified Try to smile, but keep your back to the roiling, really angry crowd. And that act, that act uh, quieted the crowd. In fact, many of the Iraqis behind them on the, on the film uh, began to uh, actually kneel as if in prayer. Hmm. And it was a magical moment. And the reporter watching this thing tried to track down who was this guy. Well, it turns out this guy is a 35-year-old fellow named, uh, he's Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Hughes, and he's, he, was, he caught him at home in Iowa on leave, and he said, and he said uh, Colonel, how, what got into you? How did you know, how did you, well, think about that act, think about what it did, because it quelled, it really quelled, it could have been a tragedy, I mean, really more, more, more than, because it would have been American soldiers looking as if they were massacring, massacring crowds of these scared, frightened Iraqis who were just rolling down from the steps of the mosque. And, you know, had that Midwestern kind of um, humble quality that's so admirable. I said, I don't know, he said to the report, I don't know what got into me. Uh, I guess he said it was a gesture of respect. <clears throat> I thought, well, you know, and was, but then in the CNN filming, the voiceover said that Actually, Colonel Hughes had spent the evening before with El Sistani, who was the Ayatollah of that month, and got a sense of the context within which he and his men were. So think of the things that went into that one act of rifles in the air, down, quieting the men, back to the Iraqis, looking pleasant, if you can, not scared. And what went into that? Well, first of all, judgment, a judgment that uh, he, he was learning partly from Sistani, but also from others, courage, and, and, and what I'd like to call contextual intelligence. I mean, he had uh, a sense of feel. Uh, so the, the things that just come out of that are understanding the situation he's in, the context, in a, in a very, very, um, very, very foreign environment for all, all of the troops there. Secondly, that 
the sense of judgment. I mean, it would have been so easy at that moment to panic and start firing, or to at least shut up in the air, which would be enough to cause a lot of mayhem. It took that it took that judgment, that courage, that contextual intelligence, in that one split second, converted something that could have been really a tragic massacre into really a, a moment that we should be proud of. Hmm. Now, how do we get, and our job, I think, in this new environment, is how do we develop leaders that will have, have that quality of judgment, courage, contextual intelligence, leadership of a, in a broad sense. And I think, we're, we're, I don't think we can settle for just okay leaders in this, you know, what we're facing. I think we've got to aspire to a higher level of leadership, David, than we've ever had. And the challenge I think we have is how do we do this? How do we do this at, you know, anyway. Well, you, you, you make some excellent points, uh, as always. Uh, your comments really underscore how important it is for our Center for Public Leadership um, uh, to aspire to, to, to reach high levels, uh, in not only in our research, and our, but in our teaching, and in our working with students at Harvard and well beyond, the Kennedy School, Harvard at large, and, and well beyond, um, to help, uh, help, help them, to prepare them for leadership in small events and large events. I mean, here in the job, that was not a uh, an event that you know would change world history, but it changed things on the ground. Uh, and mm -hmm. as you know, leaders are called upon now to act in small ways or in, or in small locations or in big uh -huh. locations or in big on big stages. Uh, and and but the leadership qualities that are needed are much the same, whether it's on a small stage or a big stage. Uh, and increasingly, the 21st century is demanding of people that they not only have the capacities and skills of the past, but they have they adapt to new ways mm. of mm. living uh, and, and, and today and, and in the years ahead. And I thought in particular, um, uh, the, the, it, we, we need to be thinking about what additional elements does the new generation need? And I think one of them that you have pointed out is... Uh, Contextual intelligence is more important than ever because mm. you're going to find yourself as a young leader in thrown into situations that go well beyond what it might have been like where you grew up. Uh, you're going to find yourselves in, in, in situations where people from many different cultures, many different backgrounds are going to be present. Uh, and to be able to read that context, uh, someone has mm. come up with the phrase cultural intelligence. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's uh, mm -hmm. how do you... How do you both understand the cultural uh, elements that you're facing, and are, you can respect them, and also navigate among them, and, yes. and, and lead? Not easy to do. Not no. easy to do. But it, you know, we've always needed courage, and we've always needed judgment. But now you really have to be able to read the context and understand it, uh, and it's changing rapidly. And, and uh, uh, you know, any student coming through today is going to be, have to prepare to uh, work not only in one sector, but probably all three sectors, whether it be business or, or mm -hmm. uh, the public sector or the nonprofit sector. You're going to spend much of your life, you know, across working in all three sectors. And often when you're in one, you're going to be working with people in the other two. So you have to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the kinds of people around you are increasingly are going to be uh, from many different countries. And we'll speak many languages. We'll have many different um, cultural understandings, a sense of leadership. Uh, what they're looking for in leaders may differ from, say, Latin America to the United States or uh, China versus the uh, United States. Or, uh, you know, as you know, there are very different expectations. So we're going to have to have what the, you know, uh, uh, broad gauge leaders, people right. with enormous bandwidth. Uh, mm -hmm. And it seems to me our, the, the, the essential purpose of our center should be to understand how the world is changing and to help people prepare for extraordinary change and be able to adapt to extraordinary change. Mm -hmm. You've written about the importance of adaptation for years as mm -hmm. being central to to a good leadership. I, I think, well, I want to underline some of the things you just said. Center does have one of those things built in its, its 
inherent in the Center for Public Leadership, and that is you, although you focus on on the public sector, there is also a, a lot of interest in other institutional avenues. I, the thing I loved about being there for three, uh, for the fall semesters of three years, exciting years, 01, 02, 03, <laughs> is that there was a combination of, of students, some of whom were mid-career, right. some of whom were starting out getting an MPA, uh, and so on. But uh, when you think of, again, global arrhythmia, uh, I, I want to underline a word, uh, two things. You, the adaptive capacity. Right. Uh, the, the, you know, like, remember all the talk uh, during the nominating fight between Obama and, and Senator Clinton? Uh, about being ready on day one. Well, David, nobody is ready on day one. I mean, in fact, the only thing that one should be ready for on day one is surprise. <laughs> because we cannot, we don't know enough, especially now, about uh, the kind of churning the, uh, that's, that's going on. Uh, we might be able to make some predictions, but they're like earthquakes. You, you never know when they're, they're going to occur. Uh, after they occur, we can try to figure out what happened and how to prevent the next one we're not sure about yet. I'm talking about what's happening now in, in earthquake research, which we in Southern California have a little interest in. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, but this, this adaptive capacity, how do you get people to, um, to freshly imagine? How do you get people, as Lincoln put it, to disenthrall ourselves from the past? How do we get people who are open to new experiences and who whether it's trying new food or whatever it is, or trying a new, uh, I mean, I don't think we're going to have any choice for effective leaders without having that, that openness to change, that openness to new experiences. But I also want to underline another thing that was kind of buried in the Colonel Hughes' case. But you indirectly brought it up. Given oh, an overused word, diversity, and given the fact that we don't understand enough today about other parts, the word respect, I think, has a lot. When, when Colonel Hughes told a reporter on the telephone from Iowa, a gesture of respect, I tell you, that phrase has hung in my mind, David, because I think if we really, really, truly respect, uh, understand uh, what others are like, what others are going through, and I'm not just talking about China, India, Iraq, I'm talking about our own right here in this country, too. Uh, the and I remember recently, David, I played to our undergraduate class of the old Aretha Franklin song, Respect. And right. I had, those students were just clapping and applauding. But I mean, I think there's a feeling of, uh, a lot of feeling that, that you see in the workplace. That, uh, and two of my colleagues have written a recent book about it on incivility at the workplace. Well, they changed the title to Bad Behavior at the Workplace. And the incivilities they found in their research all over the world, mm -hmm. and even in Canada, one out of five people feel that they've had some experience of incivility a week, one a week. A and week. I, put, and I, I wrote a forward to the book, and I said in print, Canada? You know, because I said, Canada? Well, the, so the, the respect, which means I've got to learn about these things going on. I've really got to, really got to. And, um, this capacity to, which is tough, and I think in some ways it's partly dispositional, which makes it even, I mean, I don't want to say we all have a similar amount of potential for adaptive capacity. Right. I don't think that's true, but I do think enough of us have that, and yet we can prepare ourselves for that. And I think, if, if I know that one of the main goals of the center is how to create programs for leadership development, which is what you're doing, how do you get the research foundation for that? And, and, and then how do we go about uh, integrating the research with the, um, with the education that your students are actually experiencing? And that is there's still a, a, um, a distance between those two. Right. It, it, well, one of the central goals of, of the center, Warren, is to uh, is to recognize first of all that uh, uh, that we should be a research institution that we should encourage research into leadership. 
and we're very proud that we've doubled the size of the faculty uh, while over the last 10 years. We started out with just a handful, as you know, mm. and we, we're now up to 10 full-time faculty members. With uh, uh, We started out, we did not have a, a tenured uh, uh, faculty member um, at the center, um, and this next uh, year uh, we will have three full professors uh, uh, within our midst, um, uh, uh, Joe Nye, our former dean, has uh, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, uh, built a strong interest in leadership. He was an international affairs yes. uh, authority and still one of the most respected in the world in international affairs. But he, he acquired this intellectual interest in leadership and has written a book about a very fine book about leadership. Uh, Jen Lerner came to us uh, uh, from Carnegie Mellon, who is doing uh, research and she comes out of the field of psychology, but she's very interested in decision making and relating it to neuroscience and uh, the right. university is now supporting a full laboratory that she uh, runs, co-runs with an economist uh, uh, from uh, the arts and sciences faculty. Uh, and then Rod Kramer is coming in to join us uh, uh, this fall from the uh, Stanford, Uni uh, Stanford University Business School. We're also trying to close that gap between uh, theory and practice. As you say, it's been a large gap, and we don't want to write, uh, you know, we, we, of course, we want to have the scholars who write in peer-reviewed journals, but it's important that we also be able to make uh, the research accessible and useful to uh, students. Uh, you've warned in the past about the dangers at business schools of becoming too theoretical at the mm -hmm. faculty level and to make sure that the material, the, uh, the, the findings are accessible and useful to uh, practitioners. So we spent a lot of time trying to translate that and uh, 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 the books that we've encouraged, we've got a, a, a partnership with the Harvard Business School uh, for a series of books about leadership for the common good. And we've got a dozen books now uh, that have been published uh, oh, yes. uh, on this with more to come. And so I'm, we're very proud of all of those uh, accomplishments. But what I wanted to um, underscore, to come back to something you said, uh, uh, our sense at the center, and, and, and this is, remains a work in progress. The center remains a work in progress. It is uh, very much, we're still experimenting because this, as you know, this field is not, the field of leadership studies is not fully mature yet. Uh, it's come a long, long way under your uh, leadership, your personal leadership. The Financial Times wrote of you that uh, Warren Bennis is the man who made uh, leadership studies legitimate in the academy and gave it great uh, authority and legitimacy over the years of your research and teaching. Um, but one of the things we have discovered, Warren, is that uh, it is a strength. Diversity is a strength. And bringing a diversity of people together prepares all of them to be more adaptive and to listen with more respect and to treat with more respect people who are not like them. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a enormous strength for us at the Kennedy School that uh, well over 40% of our students are uh, international. They're from other nations than the United States. That's the highest uh, percentage of any uh, school at Harvard. Uh, so in any one classroom, you can have students from 20 or 30 countries speaking from very different cultural perspectives. So that in itself, it broadens people to prepare for a, a multicultural world. Uh, but it's also, we found to be uh, very helpful um, to bring, to have students from uh, 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 very different professional backgrounds. So the, to have uh, social entrepreneurs, you know, young people who've been out creating new Innovative organizations in the in the nonprofit sector to to deal with HIV/AIDS or you know K-12 uh, problems or children who've been left terribly behind. Um, sitting in the same classroom with uh, with veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, each side uh, benefits from that. And I, I I've actually had the experience of uh, after a you know a semester of a of a woman who'd been working for peace her entire professional career. Uh, who had voiced many anti-military uh, things, and a military veteran standing up at the end of the semester and crying, saying how much he'd learned and how they had bonded, uh, and that he had come mm -hmm. to understand her perspective, mm -hmm. and she had come to respect what he did. Uh, but to have those military veterans as well, to come back to your uh, uh, story about Najaf and, and Iraq, uh, what, we are, what, what the military veterans come back, and they make great teachers in the classroom because they have had leadership experiences where they yes. put their, their, their lives on the line. They've had their, their troops' lives on the line. Um, what they come back and tell us is that 
if you're a young officer, and this is sort of a metaphor, I think, for all of you. If you're a what? If you're, if you're a young officer now mm -hmm. uh, going to Iraq or Afghanistan, um, uh, you may have to be uh, uh, fighting on Monday, but on Tuesday you're trying to write, help write a constitution, and on Wednesday you're trying to help fix the local sewage system, and on Thursday you're trying to help negotiate conflicts uh, among local groups who are uh, various ethnic groups and uh, um, that uh, and, and and by Friday you're back out on the field with your troops again. What 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 the kind of the effort that goes into that to have, to be so adaptive in so many different ways? Mm. You know, General General Petraeus uh, is is calling us pentathlete leadership. You, that you've got to have you know sort of this multiple uh, set of talents uh, mm -hmm. to to that any one moment you may be called upon to do something very different than what you were doing the day before. Yeah. That's the world I think we're coming into yes. a writ yeah. large. I think almost everybody who's going to lead in the in the future is going to find you're not asked to just be in a in a, a narrow a cubicle right. and work on one area. You've got to be you've got to have this 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 bandwidth. And that, and our center is tries to prepare people for that. Yeah, you have a, a, you know having spent lots of time in conversation with center people with yourself, David, you know, I really did feel, do feel, I was present at the creation. Yes, and you were. So so proud to have been connected with it in the early, earliest days. But, but you have some unique uh, opportunities there and some unique problems. I want to get to both. Yep. You, 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 no other place in this country or in the world, as far as I know, uh, that's a sweeping statement, has the potential uh, in terms of the mixture of students and the fact uh, uh, of people with lots of practice and lots of experience working with people who certainly either don't have that experience or from different sectors experience. So business, and when you look at a general trend that we've noticed among our younger undergraduate, or say seniors, and it's not, I don't think they're just being kind of ridiculously idealistic but they're they're talking more and more about NGOs, about not for profits, and so on. So you, you have your student body uh, is part of the education at CPL, which very few other which say a business school that I'm in, although we have a lot of foreign students as well. But the education is in, and I've talked to some of the alums of of the Kennedy School, and they they, they talk about it with such fondness, and also the fact is. When we read the newspaper now, we not only know about that person, we've actually met that person. Huh. And it's real. But, the, here, but here, here are the, uh, here's what comes to my mind. I gave a talk about three weeks ago to Mayor Vera Gosa's top staff, about 50 people. And you know, for what you were just talking about a few minutes ago, about that, you know, this day you're going to be uh, maybe hurling grenades, but. Not, the next day, you're going to have to be making peace. The next day, you're going to have to be setting up the Constitution. The next day, you're going to have to make sure the streets are paved. The next day, you know, when you think, it's not very different than how you'd go about training a mayor because they're all front door issues. I mean, they're all, in mean, every single one, what, when you think about the troops now in Iraq, they are, they are not throwing grenades, but they are connecting with the neighborhoods. They are learning how do things that they weren't taught at West Point or at OCS at Fort Benning, where, where I, which I attended for four months. But when you think about all the different responsibilities, but, you know, I almost compare it to if you were training a group of, and you had them uh, at your mid-career program, mm -hmm. of, but just imagine you were doing a program just for mayors of large cities, LA, you know, or, uh, and the kinds of what lessons would they need? And they would need all the things we've talked about thus far and more. They'd have to understand, uh, I mentioned contextual intelligence. I want to broaden that. Uh, they're going to have to really understand the cartography of the stakeholders within their particular firmament or domain of responsibility, right? Okay. So, I mean, but the center is uniquely poised. Uh, not just because of the makeup of the student body and the, and the, cre the goals and creed of the school uh, under the direction of Dean Elwood, but, but um, you also have the advantage 
of other departments working with you. I'm, I'm talking about the psychology and sociology and economics departments, which working with, you don't need to have them all on the CPL staff, although right. I think the fact you're getting free tenured, I, I know the free you talk about and the work they're doing. Uh, and I'm so enthusiastic about, about their, well, Rod's coming and I, I know a little bit about, more and more about Jennifer's work. Uh, uh, you, you know, what I'm saying is you got a confluence of advantages there, but they are also incredible challenges to pull this off. I mean, that's what makes me sweat at night. I mean, <laughs> you and I can sit here and talk about these qualities. I can compare it to a mayor's. Because I do think there's something about, simply because I spoke to 50 managers within the city of Los Angeles, you know, from the traffic people to Chief Bratton to, you know, and I'm thinking, well, how does the mayor deal, especially where you have some limited power, especially in L.A. where the mayor doesn't have, the county of supervisors are much more powerful. So, but you have the, one of the advantages you have the people there, that is the students, will help bring, bring about that understanding of different cultures. You have a, a first-rate faculty both in the Kennedy School and, you know, that you can draw on from Harvard. You've got the, you've got that um, thing that I'm very jealous of, the convening authority of Harvard. You can bring people there that other places cannot that easily bring. So, uh, so the opportunities that you have, the challenges that we have, have um, make me very nervous. I mean, you know, even though I, I am extraordinarily hopeful, even though this may be, and because I do not think that we have sorted out the answers both at the economic, macroeconomic level especially. I don't think we've sorted out all the issues of what, well, of what it, when we talk about leadership development, you know, how many longitudinals that we've talked about this before, but I want to make a thing of it again. How many longitudinals, if you really are serious about development, what do we find out about it? Do we follow people over a 25-year period like George Valiant has done and others? Because it's, it's very expensive. You can't get tenure if you're uh, if you're Jennifer and you're, or Jennifer does have tenure, but if you're an aspiring assistant professor on tenure track, uh, how would you be able to do a longitudinal study? You know, because by the time you have your third year, you should have your thesis ready. But uh, I think the two trends that I think are very hopeful for us are partly really figuring out figuring out ways we could do longitudinal studies in the short run, and there are, there are ways of doing that. And another area that we've not talked about yet, is, which I think is promising, but, it, but one shouldn't get their hopes up too high too quickly, and that is in the area of neurosciences. Mm -hmm. So when we bring those two things into the fold, it frustrates you, me more to think about all we have to do. I have, a, I have a suggestion, which I made to Rod Kramer when we talked on the phone the other day. I said, it would be an interesting exercise for the center, and maybe even a useful one, if you brought together a group of people who represented what you think would make up a leadership canon or what is required for a PhD program in leadership. I don't know. There, there, is, there are one or two schools that do a PhD in leadership, but they're not first rate. And they're not in first rate universities. They're not in major research universities. And there's just a tiny number of them. And I wouldn't even mind. They're not even, but I don't even want to go into them now because they're not worth looking at yet. But if you can bring together the, the requisite people who represent the various streams of this thing called leadership and try to develop a PhD in leadership development or leadership more broadly, uh, I think I think we would all profit enormously from that. And you've got the horses to do that there. And you know, it, it's it, it's almost I'm really saying is. This is a simulation, in a way. You can think of it that way. It isn't, doesn't mean you're going to start the PhD program with those. That may be an outcome. But it's a very tangible task. It isn't another task force to talk about leadership development. You're going to actually create a program of two to three years where people can actually come to the only place that might be able to offer this, which is the Center for Public Leadership. And, and 
you know, all the things, they're all there, all the pieces are there. And the challenge, David, that I'm glad I'm not the director of the center, is how do you bring it all together? Well, once again, Warren, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've thrown down the gauntlet for us and, and, and challenged us to, to aspire even higher. And uh, uh, I, I do think it is incumbent upon us, one of our major uh, undertakings over the next two or three years uh, should be to uh, seek a greater coherence in our curriculum for the students who are at the Kennedy School and have come to the Kennedy School and come to our center um, so that there's a more integrated sense of what the courses are and what the path may be. And that would pave the way toward, uh, I hope uh, one day, a uh, potential uh, PhD program that mm. students who came through and studied, uh, you know, took two or three years of classes and then wrote a thesis. Uh, you know, I, it probably would have to be combined with a field like psychology or mm -hmm. organizational behavior or the like. Uh, somehow it would have to be, uh, have those academic roots as well. But I think the day is, uh, it, it's, it's clear that a growing number of scholars uh, are, uh, have grown curious about leadership. Uh, what we often find is that uh, scholars who have developed in another field altogether and then had a leadership experience, as you did, I mean, running a university as you did, uh, suddenly become deeply interested in the question of leadership because they realize how vital it is uh, for organizations. Uh, but let me come back to uh, 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 a couple of things you said, Warren. I, you spoke about mayors uh, as, as mm -hmm. having this wide uh, uh, array of responsibilities. It's, the, the mayors uh, are, are just like these young soldiers and so many other public officials. It is absolutely true that on any given day, you may have to be doing something that's very different from what you did yesterday. You may, you may run for mayor and have to be a very good politician to get elected, uh, but once you get there, you're going to, uh, on day one, the first thing you're going to have to do is wrestle with a terrible budget dilemma or set of dilemmas, and you're going to have to understand finances. And on the day two, you may have some uh, problem in your public schools, and you're going to have to understand, um, you know, what, how, how children learn and what, uh, and, and what, do, we, mm -hmm. what do we know from experiences mm -hmm. in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And on day three, you may suddenly be faced with a public health scare. Here, here comes flying flu. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that may overwhelm your hospitals, and you you, and you have to understand a little bit about the science, but also about how public health works. So there is a, I think every public leader today is going to be faced, and in the future is going to be increasingly faced with this wide array of challenges when you walk in the door, and it means you have to be, to, to be successful at that, you have to prepare yourself for a life on a big stage. And, I, mm -hmm. going, back, going back to the opening of the center 10 years ago, I must confess that I, that's the time when I was very nervous. Uh, I, uh, I, I, we, we, the Kennedy School promised that it was there to uh, train leaders for the future. We had a center, we had a little bit of money to get started, but I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> and that's I just a simple to... idea. Just train leaders for the future, David. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was... Uh, uh, it was very unclear to me, okay, what do you actually do in the classroom? What do you actually teach? <laughs> what courses do you offer? And, and we had a, a pioneering course there with Ron Heifetz at the time. He was extraordinarily right. popular um, and remains one of our most influential uh, teachers. We're very proud that he's there uh, at, the, at, at Harvard and teaching at the Kennedy School, part of our center, a major part of our center, uh, co-founder of the center. Uh, but we just had a, just a handful of courses when we started well, you know, over the last 10 years, I think we've now got some 50 courses uh, in one that one way or another uh, try to come to grips with leadership challenges. Um, but, but I have to say what, what has also given me great heart, Warren, over the course of this last 10 years, uh, and that is that um, uh, about five years ago, we first started creating scholarship programs for students. We were able to get in a Scholarship fund mm -hmm. from Zuckerman for, uh, for, for 25 scholarships a year from Catherine Reynolds and the Reynolds Foundation for another 25. Les Wexner, who's been, a, been of course, our primary benefactor, and he and Abigail have been wonderful, wonderful mm. uh, patrons for the center and been great leaders in their own right. They have a scholarship program for Israeli students. We have another scholarship program more recently for from Bill George, whom you uh, know well uh, as a... Uh, as a, a, a very enlightened uh, leader at Medtronic, a business CEO who now teaches the Harvard Business School and his works on it, authentic leadership are extremely influential at Harvard. But uh, the point of all of this is that 
over these last five years, we have had some 250 students come through now with scholarships through the center. We've been sort of their home while they've been there. And what we have found is these students have scholarships that enable them not only go to the Kennedy School, but also they a lot of them go on get joint degrees at the business school. Many of them get degrees from the School of Public Health. Many of them right. get student degrees from the School of, uh, of Education. Public That's health right. as well, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you've got Kennedy, Public Health, Education, Business School, Law School, all represented, mm. and, and the Medical School, all represented in these uh, uh, among these scholarship students. And they come together on a regular basis, uh, the students do, often for dinners, for outside speakers, for retreats, for trips to Washington, New York, San Antonio, uh, field field trips, and it's the coming together while they're students with for, with people of different perspectives that they when they talk about how do we solve the problem of uh, energy and climate change, you suddenly got people there from many different perspectives talking to each other and encouraging each other and holding each other to high standards of future contribution, looking at each other in the eye and say, I'm going to go out and change the world. What about you? And where are you going? What are you going to be doing? And so now we have this group of students who have become, it's not the faculty teaching them, they're teaching each other and they're learning from each other. And mm. this, this jointness where they sort of, we break down the walls among schools at Harvard and really throw open and say, the solution to any one of our public problems, one of our urgent threats, is not going to come from any one field. It's going to come from people working across fields. And here's what has happened this last this last semester. Uh, Warren, you, uh, I'm sure, read about the fact that uh, students at the Harvard Business School self-organized to take an oath uh, when they graduated, a Hippocratic oath. That went, you know, it was not just do. It was it was not enough just simply don't, don't do harm. But it was they took got good up and took an oath, pledging that in the future that as as in the business world, when if the many of them working in the business world, they would not be simply about the bottom line about shareholder value. That would not be their only value. That they would try to lead for the common good. That they recognized that in the business community they had this larger responsibility of the common good, and they got and it was organized pretty late in the semester, and they got about sixty percent, seventy percent of the class to take this oath. The whole idea of taking a, an oath out of business school is now spreading. Um, the old idea that, that, that management should be more of a profession, which has been promoted by two professors at the business school, Rakesh Karana and, and uh, Nit and Nori have done wonderful jobs. You know them both. Mm. But here, here's, the, here's the other the point. The people who organized that oath taking at the business school were primarily students who were, had, had who'd been through these joint degree programs, had been at the Kennedy School, had been at our center, and also studied hmm. in business school or studied somewhere else. And it, the, it, 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 made it, it has made a real difference for us at the Kennedy School to have business school students studying in our midst. They bring more crunch. They bring some backbone mm -hmm. into, the, into the Kennedy mm -hmm. School um, as a school of public service. But they, when they go to the business school, they bring more of a heart to the business school and more sense of social conscience. And having this, uh, this, this culture, which is developed now around the center, that the center has helped to promote, working with these other schools, these wonderful faculty members of the other schools, is we've now started to create a student culture where the students themselves are uh, they're catalysts for each other. And they're setting standards for each other. And they're starting to show leadership while they're in school. Mm. They're not waiting to exercise their leadership on yes. the out. They're yes. seeing their time at the at a university as being a time when they can begin to exercise leadership in a, in a more forceful way and begin to change not only the, the, the schools, but begin to change the professions themselves, to take a pledge that we are going to change the business profession. We're going to go out and try to do this and try to be pioneers out in this area. I think that's you know one of my proudest uh, days, and the reason I have so much more confidence about where we are now as a center is I think we're starting to create a culture and we have a generation that this is not what we've done, but what's happened and in, 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 I think around the world is there's a generation coming up that's much more idealistic. Yes. That's really devoted to change, that cares a lot about innovation, that finds the world as it is unacceptable, that they do not want to bring their kids up mm -hmm. in this kind of world. And they realize that time is short. 
that, that uh, matters are urgent and that they have to prepare themselves while in school and begin exercising leadership while in school to change the world. That's what gives me a lot of confidence. And I go back to the point you started with, and that is times are hard, they're very tough, but you can take, it somehow gives you more encouragement when times mm -hmm. are tough mm -hmm. because you see the best rise up and say, yeah. we're taking this in hand, we're going to change the world. Yeah. That, that's inspirational what you just said, and David and I agree with it. I don't know how much more time we have left, but I mean, just, I don't know what I can even add to that. But I do think we really have no choice right now. Given what you just how our, you described our student population, given what's going on in our society, uh, I, I I I don't think we can want to or escape from that, those issues and the responsibilities. If you were kind of concerned when you, you start when you took over in 2000, you should be more concerned right now in 2000 almost 2010 because because we really do. Have a, I think a huge responsibility, and the, the good news is, uh, I think we, the, the example you gave of the those MBAs who got together with the Hippocratic Oath, right. is very important, uh, because the, if you, if you think about leadership in general, one of the if, if there is any any um, as Max Dupre, our friend said, the first task of a leader is to define reality, and we are creating, and the world is helping us. There are there are partners in this. Some of them are unfriendly, but a lot of the, 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 there are the, the, the society is working with us. We're on the right side of history right now, and unless right. we take advantage of that, because our students are a different breed. Uh, they, they're no longer the organization, and they're no longer just careerists. I think they are concerned about changing the world, and we have got to, and I think there's enough fresh thinking among our young faculty uh, and even cough, cough among some of our older faculty <laughs> to have ideas that would be very, but I do think the responsibilities are really with us. But I think, again, keep in mind, how do you, def how do you define reality? And I think that example of the MBA is a very interesting shift in reality from, to put it in different terms from, the, as you said, the bottom line to the fact that there are other responsibilities and purposes of the human organization. And I think, uh, to put it just a little bit more broadly, abstractly maybe, I think we've got to help develop individuals who will help create organizational, institutional systems which will bring out the very best in the people, the most, the most creativity. It's both ends of the deal. It's individuals who will uh, grow, be at their best selves, but it's also an organization system, many of which have design flaws, but which have to be actually created to provide the, the kind of the safety place, the, the pattern where uh, they can feel less afraid to invent. And that interaction between develop how organizations develop people who are unafraid, fearless, and concerned with innovation, and how do we create those, or, those systems, and how do we make those systems create individuals who will take up those challenges. And boy, that, it's both, and that's that's really you know, a challenge for the center and all of us, because we're not just thinking about individuals, we're also thinking about those institutional systems which can either bring out the best or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fortunately, we have, uh, uh, Warren, at the Kennedy School and elsewhere across uh, Harvard University, um, a number of scholars who are worried about the institutional arrangements and the architecture, because I think there is a recognition, growing recognition, that much of the world's architecture that was built uh, uh, just after World War II and was extraordinarily successful has now run its course, right. and that you need to renew, refresh, and rebuild. And one of the challenges of the, uh, this generation of leaders and the ones coming just after them is going to be, how do you, how do you uh, revive the United Nations and make it an effective instrument uh, for world peace, how do, how do you take the uh, the World Bank and and really assure that it's a, a factor of the IMF or many other uh, of these institutions? Because uh, and the G8, which is now sort of outlived its usefulness, we talk about the G20. How do you bring in Brazil, Russia, India, China, the so-called BRIC nations? Um, uh, how do you close the gap on climate change between the developed and the developing nations? 
Um, these are all going to be, again, uh, additional challenges. Mm -hmm. One of the encouraging uh, developments, uh, Warren, in, in, in recent years has been the uh, development of a partnership uh, with the World Economic Forum, which, as you know, is, uh, is headquartered in Switzerland and holds, holds an annual gathering in Davos that, that, that uh, is a magnet for some 2,000 business leaders, nonprofit leaders, uh, many, many other people come there. Uh, and they, uh, the World Economic Forum has a program called Young Global Leaders, mm. in, in which uh, <laughs> uh, uh, people who are 40 and under are selected from around the world and designated mm. and invited to Davos. But the, uh, uh, the World Economic Forum came to the Kennedy School and, and the Center for Public Leadership to form a partnership with them to bring young global leaders to Harvard for mm. uh, executive education programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get about 65 at a time, uh, and uh, they come from all over the world, from all different kind of backgrounds, all, all sectors. Uh, and Harvard, at the Kennedy School, we provide the best faculty we can. Kennedy School faculty, business school, they come from all across the university. And uh, the Center for Public Leadership is a, is, is, uh, works with our, our dean, David Elwood, who's a wonderful dean uh, at the school, at the Kennedy School. Uh, to put this on, and uh, uh, because we've been centrally involved, I've had a good chance to be and work with these uh, young global leaders when they come through, and I am very encouraged by them as well. I see in these young global leaders this same hunger that we see in the younger generations who come, the younger students who come to Harvard, this same hunger for social change, this same hunger for a more just, uh, equitable, and peaceful world that across the world now there is a sense that the status quo is unsustainable and unacceptable uh, and uh, they are there they they want to lead they want to be part of that movement so I think there's a hunger for for opportunities to lead I think there's a people want to go out and make a difference and it's our responsibility as center to uh, to to uh, help them to be good to be good stewards to be Part of that generation that that helps to, that helps them understand what the challenges are and helps them understand what is leadership about. Who have been leaders that you ought to study? Where can you find your role models? How what you can learn learn from people's failures as well as their successes. Know that you're going to fail yourself. I teach a class to the young global leaders about adversity and failure and how they how do you respond to failure? The resilience that you talk about mm -hmm. so often in your in your work and and, and adaptive. Uh, qualities. How do you pick yourself up off the floor? Because everybody fails. If you're going to be bold about life, you're going to fail uh, along the way at some point. And uh, but I just I have just come away uh, these last uh, few years at the center with enormous sense of excitement, uh, a, a dread about what will happen if we have bad leadership, dread about uh, what will happen if we follow the example of the early 20th century and go down the wrong roads, but excitement that we can take a different path, that we can take a higher road. And I think the center can be a uh, can play a very helpful role uh, in trying to in trying to encourage us to take that higher path. So uh, this is a, as you say, uh, we 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 live in extraordinary times, uh, but they're times for extraordinary mm -hmm. opportunities. And uh, uh, I think I think a lot of us take great pride that we're building a center that can contribute in some some way mm -hmm. uh, in our own small ways. Uh, and uh, Warren, you said. Uh, uh, you, you quoted uh, uh, Max Dupre uh, earlier on, who was, of course, a, a CEO, a great enlightened CEO, and wrote a lot about leadership. And as you said, uh, Max Dupre said, the first responsibility of a leader is to, is to define reality. He then added, the last responsibility of a leader is to say thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's in that <laughs> sense, uh, we thank all of those who have been engaged with the center. But I do want to thank you, Warren, because you were, you were a major, major architect of this work at the center. Uh, you brought your 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 life's work. You brought your commitment to the future, but most of all, you brought your passion uh, to to this endeavor. And we're just enormously grateful to you for all that you've been. You've been our, as you know, you've been our role model at the center uh, for these past ten years, and you'll continue to be our inspiration in the future. So thank you. Thank you, David.
Warren, you and I have been talking about the quality of leadership in this country and the world for a good number of years, but it's never seen uh, more than today the need for leadership, effective leadership in what we face today. Do you agree with that? Uh, David, I, I do. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if I can point to one of the things that the center is doing, which uh, began about five years ago, I think, which is the National Survey on Confidence in Our Leadership. And I use that diagram all the time, showing in every single institution, with a possible exception of military, it's really had a deep downward slope from 05. And the last one was 08. And, you know, there, almost in every case, uh, there's been a, a, a deeper decline than one would expect. Because I always think there's a, a, a times in our society regularly where we think, well, you know, we don't have enough leadership, so, so I think it's especially acute right now. But, and I think, because I think it's going to create a generation, what I'm calling the crucible generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's, it's a time when great leaders are formed, and at the time when there are opportunities that the center has, that we have, that the country has, because that's when leaders are forged and formed. Yeah, one is inevitably reminded of uh, Abigail Adams writing to her son, yeah. uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, when he was a young boy, and saying that, that times of adversity uh, are the ones that call forth great statesmen, uh, people who's, who, who, are, who are forged in, in, in hard times and face hard challenges. Uh, that's when people step forward, and, and, and you do. But I, my, my own sense, Warren, in a, in a broader way, as I've looked over the last 10 years, uh, is that there's a parallel between uh, the opening of this new century and the opening of the 20th century. You know, the, uh, the 20th century began um, uh, with a sense of triumphalism. Uh, there had been peace in Europe uh, since the times of Napoleon. Uh, there were great inventions coming online. Mm -hmm. uh, trade was increasing among nations. Uh, and it, as, we, as we went from the 1800s to the 1900s... It's acute for all sorts of reasons. But just to put a little bit in context, uh, just think, when you when you began the center in 2000, uh, it was a dot-com bomb, bust. Uh, before that, there were the scandals of corporate America, Enron being the emblematic example, MCI and many others. Uh, and then we had 9-11, three, uh, I think, uh, axial turning points, seismic, tectonics really shaking. And then finally, now that this incredible global financial uh, crisis we're in, those four pivotal events, I think, you know, it's in your face. And we, and in, in the center, uh, to anywhere, you're dealing with these kinds of issues right now. It's the most challenging, most exciting period of time. I mean, I, I really think in some way, without sounding uh, sappy about this, that this is, I'm encouraged uh, by the challenges we're facing. Uh, there was a widespread, there were widespread commentaries that the 1900s were going to be a new golden age uh, in, in human history. And then what happened? Uh, the next 50 years were the bloodiest in all of human history. Uh, and we went over a cliff economically. And, uh, you know, it was uh, when, when John Maynard Keynes was asked, uh, uh, in the early years of the Depression, have we ever seen anything like this before? He said, yes, that was called the Dark Ages. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and people, you know, as you know, have asked, well, what, what happened? Why did we go off the rails in the first 50 years of the, of the uh, 20th century? And uh, there are many explanations, but one from uh, uh, John Keegan, uh, the British military historian, who said, if you want to understand the history of the 20th century, uh, you can find it, and especially the political history, you can find it in the biographies of six men. Uh, and uh, they, who really wrote the history of that century, or early part of it. And he said they were Lenin, uh, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Churchill, and Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that list, you know, four of them were tyrannical leaders. Um, and they really helped to take us over a cliff. They, they led all that bloodshed. Uh, and had it not been for the last two, uh, Western civilization might have perished as we have known it. So. It was that there was a quality of bad leadership that got us into a lot of trouble, and I worry a lot that the twenty the twenty first century opened again with a sense of triumphalism. We we were you know the Cold War was over, 
The United mm -hmm. States had emerged as a great superpower. It was since you know history was over, as Francis Fukuyama wrote. The the war, the ideas of liberty and uh, free peoples and free markets had triumphed, uh, and that we were we we were managers of our own prosperity. Trade was growing. Globalization was going to be a great thing, and here we are, you know, almost ten years into the century. And a lot of terrible things have happened. And so I think the question becomes for us now, can we provide the quality of good leadership that takes us in a much more positive direction, or are we going to suffer from a, a lack of good leadership, or are we going to have some really terrible leadership that could repeat some of the mistakes of the early uh, uh, 20th century? So to me, that's the, the mm -hmm. challenge, the fundamental challenge, mm -hmm. and, and why leadership becomes so important.